Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe was filled, oh, the hem of his robe filled the temple. Angelic beings were in attendance above him. He had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the angelic beings flew to me, <coughs> holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The angelic being touched my mouth with it and said, Now this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. So, this should be... A real easy sermon for us all to follow this morning. I only have to focus on two things. One is Memorial Day. And the second, the Trinity. Should be easy enough. Uh, I remember any time I, every time we come to Trinity Sunday, I don't know if you guys know this, today's Trinity Sunday. Uh, John, I, I think of you. Remember a few years back we had that Trinity Sunday where I made you the iced tea and the lemons? And, tell me you remember this. This was one of my best sermons. <laughs> You don't remember? <laughs> remember that sermon, guys? I mean, this is a long time ago, but it was like it was more about like uh, all these different explanations on what the Trinity could be. And I'm not going to spend really, in all honesty, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Trinity today. I thought every year I, I spend, um, I do do a series on it, and this year I want to spend a little bit more time on 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 um, a Memorial Day. However, I, I just want to leave this this idea of uh, the Trinity. First, that the, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a theological term that we've come up with to, to, to witness to God in our lives. It, it, the Trinity, however, is seen in the scriptures. And you know, you've heard of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. In Bible study on Wednesday, this would be a great topic for us to go off of. We're going to be starting on the problem with evil, just to get a topic going. But we found that in our Bible study, when we come with just ideas and thoughts and questions, that we're such a covenant group that we seem to go further with it that way. So we're going to try that. But maybe, maybe we could talk a little bit about Trinity, if you'd like. But the reason I do mention it today on Trinity Sunday is the more I have learned through the years on this theological term, Trinity, the less I know what it means, okay? But rather, the more I spend in awe and wonder of where God meets us in the world, okay? The Trinity is not meant to be a puzzle to be solved. It's not a Rubik's Cube to just waiting to be discovered. It's not a chess match. The Trinity is, should leave us in awe and wonder in how God meets us in so many miraculous ways. Now, as I approach this message today on Memorial Day, as we see an, uh, this town which is filled with much patriotism, I, I recognize this when I was first appointed, although I was a lifelong resident, I didn't understand how deep the culture here in Wesley was of being a, a, a town that has been uh, built up primarily, a lot of it has been built up because of people that retired from World War II. And so I saw what a patriotic um, community this is, and it told me that I need to, 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 to focus on that and see that the parishioners is important to the parishioners. But I find as the pastor of the church, I also have to be mindful to remind us that God is not just the God of this nation, but the God of all nations. And, and that's important for us to remember. And, and, and it's hard because sometimes pastors can be apologetic on, uh, towards God loving this nation. Right? Because God, God does love this nation. But sometimes it's like, well, don't forget that God loves all nations. And that's where we need to be mindful today, that, that God, like the Trinity, isn't just one or the other, but God meets us in all different elements. It's not one or the other. 
It's not an if-then statement. Through the power of the Trinity, we can see God everywhere we go. So I'm going to ask for an amen with that as I, as I, as I attempt to, to bring a scripture to you that is much meaning to me. There's a third part of this you're going to soon discover, that this scripture, believe it or not, has deep meaning to me. It has a fond memory. And I thought it was so appropriate to, to what does it mean when we say the words, God bless America. Okay? So you guys ready to go on a journey with me? All right. Isaiah. This scripture reading, you may say, Barry, why do you find this scripture reading so familiar, fondly in your heart? Well, about 16 years ago, I was invited to what we call DCOM, District Committee on Ordained Ministry, meet and greet. This is when I felt I first really felt my calling in the, in the Methodist Church uh, to be a preacher of the Christian message. And the District Committee had ordained ministry. They wanted to have an opportunity where new candidates could just come in and meet people and for a light luncheon. Methodists love to have light luncheons. <laughs> we used to do potlucks. I don't know what happened with that. Um, what was, uh, they, they continue this tradition today. Every year they'll have a meet and greet for uh, DCOM. And, you, and the pastor will go with the new candidate. And it's a lovely time to get to know one another. Well, at this particular time years ago, it was very formal. And it didn't feel, I felt a little intimidated, which is an understatement. I felt very intimidated. But I wanted to leave a good impression, you know? And um, so Janu, Reverend Janu Chung from my home church and I, we went to the Cape, Cape Cod, and we went to this meeting. And as we were, you know, introducing each other, and I made myself known, and they had a whole bunch of other candidates, they decided to do a little theological breakdown. See where we're starting, okay? And this was the scripture reading they decided to start with. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't know this scripture existed. Okay? The Bible's a big book, and I was working my way through it. I was going through the, what I call the good stuff. I was going through the, the New Testament. It's all good stuff, but I was reading through the New Testament. And I thought I, I, thought I was pretty shocked with my theology. And so they read this, and, and they said, so what do you think about this scripture reading? And everybody just looked around kind of scared, and I said, this is my time to impress Right. So there's a proverb. There's a proverb uh, that goes something along the lines: When one keeps their mouth closed, one might suspect the person's a fool. Only when they open it does that person verify it. <laughs> so I learned a lesson that day. Um, I remember on the ride home when I was sharing. I'm going to share a little theology with this in a minute. Um, I'm not going to share the theology I gave about 16 years ago. Uh, I remember on the way home, Janu said, when you raised your hand, I just put my hand down on my face and said, oh, no. <laughs> because let's face it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated scripture, right? When um, Tracy uh, were reading it, like, you know, it's like all of a sudden it's talking about these hot coals going to our lips. And we're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I, I couldn't even tell you what I said, but I can tell you this much, I did not overly impress them. <laughs> Let's do a little scripture. Let's do a little scripture. In the, in the year of the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Now, who's I in this? It's not a trick question. Yeah, Isaiah. Isaiah, the great prophet. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Now, let's, let's just see what the scripture is saying to us. Let's, let's picture. I could, when I was reading this, I was picturing um, a couple of years ago, I took an art class, a basic art class, and I realized that how much art, all ancient art, is dedicated to the church. And, and I could just have this vivid image. And I didn't put one up for you, Tix. I wanted you to have your own. But picture a piece of artwork that's being described where it says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. I'm kind of picturing a little bit of like, you know that uh, Michelangelo's the, the um, creation of Adam? And behind God you have this big robe. I'm picturing this magnificent, I know I'm, I'm not trying to paint a picture of heaven for you, I'm just picturing this artwork of, of this magnificent church with gold leaf painted in it, with, with this very, you know, kind of stereotypical image of God, right? With this huge, like, kingly, um, kingly um, robe flowing out. Do you picture that too, or is it a totally different image? 
Now, I'm not trying to paint a picture of God for you. I'm trying to paint what, what, what is going through my mind when I first read that. Because when we identify how we see things, then we can say, hey, maybe something else is going on here. And we recognize that in this royal court, in this holy temple, that, that the rope fills the entire, the entire area. Now I'm picturing kind of more of like a royal wedding, right? With a, right? And there was an angelic beings were um, attending above him. This is very typical in the Old Testament. We're not going to spend any time on it. This is just like a little, maybe it will come up in jeopardy sometime and you'll hit the buzz and you'll say, Pastor Barry, he's the one that gave it to me. In the Old Testament, angelic beings were often in this temple. It was an image that was painted upon them. This is that biblical memory that how they saw God. And, and these aren't our typical angels, are, are they? You, some of you heard me preach on this particular topic before. We see this in Ezekiel as well. We see these angels, not, but not, not like with the typical what we would see on, if we went to like Hallmark looking for angels, right? These are kind of strange. You've got six wings, and it's covering their eyes and their feet, and, and some are flying, and, and it's kind of odd, isn't it? Yeah. As I've preached before, I think it's a little scary. Now, here's a message within the message. When we see God in the world and in our lives, sometimes it's a little strange. Sometimes it's a little scary. We'll just keep moving. And one of them called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled or full of his glory. This changes that image now. This is kind of like our image of going to church and God's grace filling that church. And then we hear the heavens declaring God as holy, not of just the building, but of where? The whole earth. Everywhere. You see how this message transcends? You would think, like when I first read this, you say, I don't think there's a real lot there. I mean, there's some images that really paint a picture. But we realize that there's a ton of theology, a ton of word on God and what it's saying. And I think this brings us instantly into Memorial Day, where yes, God is loose in this nation, but God is not contained to this nation, for God's grace spreads throughout, where does it say? The whole earth. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to be talking about this on Wednesday when we talk about the problem with evil. And I'm just going to say that little tidbit where, where there is God, there is life. The pivots on the threshold shook and the voice of those who called in the house filled with smoke. All right. Biblical thinking caps. We're in the Old Testament. You've heard of You've seen God before in smoke, have we not? Where have we seen God being uh, in the image of smoke and fire? I'm going to put Linda on the spot. Who was leading him? Man, you got it. Gold star. That's right where I was hoping you'd go. And we didn't, pre we didn't set this up. Yes, it was God was, God was leading uh, up Mount Sinai, right? And, and it was a pillar of smoke. And Moses went up, and that's the famous story of the commandments, correct? But we find this is in the Exodus story. This is very important. This is what the people who heard the story in the prophet Isaiah's mind instantly went to. Instantly went to. They're like, hey, I remember this story. The last time we were in real trouble, right? We, we left Egypt and God showed God's self as a pillar of smoke and, 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 and created this great leader, Moses. And Moses went up and, 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 and met God. And remember, his face was shining. And if you don't remember this, I'm in a Bible study. See, I keep plugging that today. <laughs> then Isaiah says something. Woe is me. I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. Now maybe you think I may be a stretch here, but I, I do believe confidently that this is a biblical memory going on here where this is continuing that Exodus story. A story of people that were being oppressed who fled an area, although they were, although they were being treated very, very uh, inappropriately, they still had enough to eat, and they had enough to drink, and they were able to live. And then they were led out into the desert, now they're afraid, and they were lost. 
This is the same story where Isaiah is saying, I am just like the nation of Israel back in Egypt that, that just felt we're lost and, and we're done and we don't know where to go. Has we, have we ever felt that way as a nation? Have you ever felt that way as a person? Right? Now the caveat to this message, and, and I, I, I knew I was going to hit it at some point. I might as well just get it done now. What I fear today is that those in our nation that feel lost is another side of Americans that feel that they're found. And there seems to be this great divide. And that scares me a little bit. I, I'd like to see us come together more as a people of, of, of a nation that's under God, that's, that's been, that's been uh, blessed by God. There's a hierarchy to this, right? We're a nation under God. I'm giving a lot today, and I hope I'm not... A, Maybe, maybe none of it will speak to you. I pray that it does through the power of the Spirit. But at the very least, I hope there are moments that speak to you. And I, I do ask that you stay with me on this because there's a lot to be said. Have you felt individually, woe is me, I am lost. I am unworthy. I have unclean lips. And I live among people with unclean lips. Where's the hope in that? Can we see that this is, not just only a, this is not only a person who feels lost, but perhaps a person who is ready to be found? Just a few minutes ago, we lifted up our prayer of confession. Prayer of confession is not an opportunity to say, woe is me, I'm not worthy, and then I'm just going to go away with my head down. Rather, it's an opportunity for us to see areas in our lives where we can grow where God can shed light and God can lift us up to be something so much more. I know that's hard to see sometimes, right, in the church. Like to, the church often likes to beat people down and you know, tell you constantly you're not worthy. Fine, we're not worthy, but we have been made worthy through Christ, <clears throat> through the love of God. So when woe is me, we have a choice. We can say, woe is me, and I decide to hide away somewhere. Or rather, I can say, woe is me, my, my lips are, are unclean, I'm not worthy, but God calls me anyway to be a miracle in someone's life, in my, in my family's life, in my community's life, in our nation's life, in the life of the world. It's like, all right, you're not worthy, get over it and move on. Now that you recognize that there's brokenness in you, and recognize that there's also something better, perfection. I hate going to the doctor. I fight it. I don't like medicine. I've told you this before. I'll go hours with a headache until I finally recognize the fact that, hey, you got a headache, take some aspirin. Hey, you got strep throat, go to the doctor. Woe is me, I'm not worthy. We've got the great physician. We have a God who sends God's grace among all the nations of the world, and that includes us here now today. Yet my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. I'm not worthy, but yet I see God in my life. I see God in those lives around me. I see God working in the lives of people that aren't worthy. Do you? And if not, can I invite you to try harder to see that? Preachers preach into himself this morning, guys. This isn't a one-way message. It's a reminder. Do you guys remember what happened after September 11th, 2001? Do you remember? after the fear and we saw the smoke. I remember the thing to do was to put an American flag on your antenna of your car or truck. Did anybody do that? I'm curious. My cousin was working with us at the time, brought one in for me on a job I was working on and I taped it to my antenna. All the way home, people were beeping their horn and waving to me and giving the thumbs up, thumbs up and for a minute we felt united. Do you know what happened to the churches after that day? There was rumors in Boston that they had to turn people away because they could not fill, the church could not handle all the people that were coming out. And for a brief minute, in all of our brokenness and pain, we were united. And now we get cut off and we jump out and we want to get into a fist fight over someone not see, stopping at a stop sign or, or maybe somebody took something from, the, from us in the store that we felt entitled to and we forget that we are not only united as a nation, or supposed to be united as a nation, but we are supposed to be brothers and sisters united by? Sure. Right. If we don't see how God is uniting us as a people of the world, then how are we going to see God uniting us as a nation? 
As I said, this is an Exodus moment. Exodus means so much more than, than, um, than the physical abuse that was happening to the people that were being held bondage as, slavery, as slaves in Egypt. It's also the bondage that we put ourselves in our daily routine of life. We see the tragedies of people that are so broken in our community. We hear the stories of, of, of the absolute abuse of, from drugs. Just recently at CCRI, we had a, a police officer open a bag and some kind of drug came out. If it wasn't for Narcan, this poor security guy would have been killed. Right? We see it, we hear a constant, constant people we love dealing with suicide. We need an exodus moment. We need to be liberated from this world. But the good news is a liberator has been sent. We are coming to the last week of Easter. But remember, the memory of Easter, as we come into ordinary time, it's time for us to do things that are, un, that are not so ordinary, that are, that are not held by the bondage of what society says we should be doing. Woe is me, I am lost. We're in the wilderness. I fear for my life, but I have hope because we have a Savior. So here's where the theology can get all messed up, and I'm sure that this is where I really impressed DCOM years ago. And I must have said something that was just, I can't even remember because I chose to, re to reset, to regress it, you know, just like put it out of my mind. Because <laughs> I could tell by their looks they weren't like, oh, good job, Barry. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I go to the Bible, right? And I say that the word purifies our lips. But it's, it's more. It's more. Because have you ever seen someone that comes out and starts, you know, thinks that the, that the hot coal of the word hits their lips and they're purified enough now to tell you what you need to do? <laughs> huh? Yeah. I've been doing a lot of studying right now to do with my major in philosophy on atheism. And, and this, is a, uh, this is not my saying. This is something that you hear a lot from, from men like Reverend... Um, Adam Hamilton or Rob Bell, where you start listening to other people's um, idea of God, atheist image of God, and you soon realize that you don't believe in that God, God either. And I say to myself, it's so many times that we think that we've been anointed by God, that God has touched our lips, purified us such a way where we start just, just preaching this book, and then next thing you know, we're hurting people because we're forgetting that message that God has come to the world, not to condemn it, but to what? To save it. How does this message get so confused? We know the words. We know the scripture. For God so loved the world that he, that, that he sent his son to, to not condemn the world, but to save the world. And that's our core theology. But yet we put that but, but, but in it. And we find instead of helping people, healing people, we end up hurting people and hurting ourselves. I say to you that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that although we say silly things at times and once in a while they're at a decom meeting, that they can see through that and see that in spite of my brokenness, in spite of my weaknesses, God can still be glorified through me. Not because of me, but in spite of me. If it was about me, I wouldn't have made it through that decom meeting years ago. I could see the grace of God shining through them saying, this kid's got a way to go still. Let's see if we can nurture them. See if we can lift them up. See, it's not about being right or wrong, but it's about how we meet people, how we meet each other, and how we can lift each other up. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now, this is Moses again. We know Moses, he wasn't an eloquent speaker at all. He said, Why? Don't send me, send my brother, you know, send somebody else. I'm not worthy. We see God doing it again through Isaiah. Now, here's the problem you guys have. This is the problem I have. After hearing this message and being broke down, we just recognize that all those that aren't worthy are now called to proclaim the good news of life. It kind of puts you guys on the spot a little bit, doesn't it? Kind of puts this church on the spot a little. It's like, Pastor, why do you got to do that? There's that moment you say, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. I'm broken. I'm, I'm lost. But you know what? Let's go for it. Send me. Let's try it. Let's give it a shot. We see that Isaiah was set apart. And this is not because Isaiah was good enough. He was eloquent enough. He, all that stuff didn't mean anything. He just finally realized that 
there's life. There's more. And God's calling Isaiah, Moses, and you. Okay. I have never, in my appointment of this church, had a parishioner give me such a hard time about playing a video. I'm looking at you, Bob. <laughs> Bob shared this. You shared this with me a couple of years ago? Or a year ago? About a year ago. He said, Barrett, I sent you this video. I want you to play it for church. I said, I watch it. I said, Bob, I don't see how this is going to fall into our Christmas message. I'm just making it. This could be anything. So I said, okay, how about we save it for the 4th of July? And Bob said, what? I'm not going to be here for the 4th of July. <laughs> now, now, pastors aren't supposed to gear their message towards one person. And I prayed, I prayed the Lord above that that's not what happened today. But the pastor's job is to know his congregation. Amen? Okay. And you don't want to get Bob mad at you. We all know that. <laughs> but after prayerfully discerning, I, I found this clip. And I thought it does fit into our message. And this year, as I said, we are focused on Memorial Day. Now, uh, Jamie, Jamie, God bless you. Years ago when I was first appointed here, you gave a beautiful message talking about um, this young pastor, and you shared the story about George Taylor, and I often known this, that I have, I have an old soul. Um, I, I, I like watching old TV shows and movies, and, and so when Bob shared this, which I'm gonna share with you, we have an old variety show with John Wayne and Tribute to America, so we're gonna play that. Tomorrow, remember, this is my country, and I'm gonna do good for it. Just my work. We'll never know unless we give it a fair try. Oh yeah, and there's one other thing I'll say tomorrow because I say it every day of my life. God bless America. <laughs> So, I, uh, I'm, I'm not the world's biggest John Wayne fan, although I, I, I know you are. <laughs> Is it getting hot in here? I've always been a Jimmy Stewart fan, and Bob and I were sharing uh, the movie The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, and I was doing a little research to see how many times did John Wayne really say uh, Pilgrim as much as we think he did, and he did. Yes. Uh, this is your opportunity to do a John Wayne impersonation. Anyone that would like to? <laughs> we already tried, didn't work. I was telling Bob this morning when I was reflecting on this and uh, John Wayne, uh, I, I kept thinking True Grit, right? I mean, that's not just the title of a movie, but the man really gave that, didn't he? Like, it's True Grit. Uh, I remember... Um, I don't know why. I don't know why I watched so much Johnny Carson when I was a kid because I was little. But I remember, I was telling Bob, I remember when John Wayne uh, came on The Tonight Show and Johnny Carson was talking about how he was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember him saying, 
I'm going to be here for a long, long time to come. And, and a year later, he passed away. And it was like, it seemed, it seemed unnatural. Like, I mean, you saw earlier, there's so many different celebrities, but, um, um, oh, what's his name? Michael Landon. Yeah. Michael Landon, same story, right? Like, you know, we gave that, you know, you grew up with him watching Little House on the Prairie, and he almost felt like a relative, and he seemed bigger than life like John Wayne, where, you know, when he was diagnosed with cancer, the same, same thing. Um, I see that we have these people that we, that we, uh, we watch over, we, we are bigger than life, but we see that in the end, they're still just as mortal as we are. And, and I, I like how John Wayne starts that. He's like, he's not asking you, right? He's not giving you a pop. I'm going to say this every day of my life, you know? <laughs> this, is, this, is why I'm, um, this is why I'm not Rich Little and a pastor, okay? You know, I know. <laughs> um, we don't really, though, deep down. I mean, there are those that are, are the real deal in Hollywood, but there's a few people up there that we saw. We know their backstory, and we don't know if they're necessarily the people we really want to emulate, right? A couple of them. Um, I'd like to be able to emulate John Wayne, but he's just so tough, you know. We find that we are in an exodus, that we're, on a, um, that we're lost and we're on a journey. And I just kept thinking John Wayne talking about the pilgrim. That's what we are. We're pilgrims. We're pilgrims on this earth trying to make it, right? I, I, I'm running a little over, but I have one quick little movie clip of today's day. This is just a few clips of how Hollywood, I was hoping Harrison would be here. Well, because he likes this stuff, you know. <laughs> I totally realize, you know, fate. There is fate. But it only takes you so far because once you're there, it's up to you. So the idea here is, when you go to Hollywood, I was just watching these different, I remember the great Hollywood ride in Disney, if you've ever been on it. At the end of it, when it's over, you just feel like, ooh, it feels so good, right? Like, that's what good directors do, that's what good movies do. They leave you in a certain emotion, and, and you hear these quotes, and you feel like you're on fire, and I realize, right, we know that words, words have genuine power. Words have power. Where are our words coming from, though, however, is really what I'm asking us to reflect upon today. Where are our words coming from? It's, it's more than just, hear me, it's, it's, the Bible is holy, the Bible is, our, is, is, is the word of God, but it, but it can't be just contained in that book, right? 
What is, the, what is the message of God speaking through us? Where do our words come from? And simply enough, I found Proverb 3, right? The, the words of God gives life. So, just quickly, I'd like to take one moment of, um, as we come together Memorial Day, it's a time for us to give thanks for all of those that have served, has given their lives. And I would ask that if uh, you have served, I'd ask you to stand. If you have a family member who is serving, would you stand? <clears throat> Do you know somebody that is serving? I ask you to stand. Well, I got news for you. Look around. Because we all are in this together. Right? Thank you. And I thank those that are serving. Um, let us always be mindful. Let us always be mindful of what this nation started, stood for. And let our service and those service there be known in gratitude. But always remember, as I often start a message, yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. And today is a blessing. As we hear the word of God, help us not fall into the trap of past mistakes, but rather see the blessing of life that God is speaking to us in our community today. Amen?